Friends in Christ, good morning. The microphone is working back here in the parish hall. So wherever you sit, you should be able to hear just fine. There's a, I'm going to adjust it a little bit here. Yeah, and I can't adjust the volume. So someone in the back's got to do it. And uh, somebody needs to do it. <laughs> we're, we're missing our sound guys today. It's it's a perfect storm. We got both our, our virtual organist and our uh, live streaming uh, professional missing today. So one of those two is usually adjusting the volume. So we just have to move it up. Right. Yeah, well, I, I, if I learned how to do it, I, I could run all the way back and do it, but then you'd have to wait for me. So we just, we do need someone there and back to run it. I don't know. So this is not Bible study related, but you know, it, it's important. Uh, for some reason, the, the volume level gets changed. Now, we don't know of anyone that comes in and changes the volume level during the week. The only thing, and it's just this one, the other ones seem to stay the same and I don't know. I mean, I know we adjust it for Bible study. So right now, Roger is, you know, turning it up and down and it sounds good. And I might even bring it back up closer. And, um, but they should stay at the level they were when the, and it's not even turned off. It's not like we turn off the sound system and then back on again. But for whatever reason, we need to get some of those hands. The yeah, up. it should be right here. Let's do that. And I've, I've told, and some mentioned it on the way out. I said, please, you know, uh, do this or uh, do this, right? And if someone's back there, they can help out with that because we do want to hear. I can't tell in front. If I knew it was too quiet, I'd start shouting. And if I, th and I can tell when it's blasting because it, then it's, there's that feedback, you know, then I can tell. But otherwise, I have no idea if, if I'm uh, drowning you out or if uh, you can't even hear a word I'm saying. So, so maybe you can make this hand motions to me as well, but there's nothing I can do. <laughs> I, one time I went to the, went up to the pulpit uh, microphone. This one wasn't working, so I went there and, and we prayed from there and that was fine. But if I know that, I can do that. So. I want to thank you for your patience and understanding as we uh, work out some technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, so we should be good for today now for Bible study. We are now on Psalm 32, and I want to say a couple of brief things about where we've been and where we're going in the book of Psalms. Again, today, Psalm 32. Each Psalm is delightfully unique. So there are going to be times when we are going to look at a his historical circumstance of a psalm. There are times when we're going to look at just, just how much a psalm in incredible detail prophesies the coming, the suffering, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. There are times when we're going to look at law and gospel in the psalms, so condemnation of our sins and forgiveness and life through faith in Christ. And, uh, and these apply every time in different ways but also application or daily life. What's a good daily or occasional or weekly use of this particular psalm, okay? So you're gonna see in the psalm for today, we already have a very regular use of this psalm in our life together as Christians. And then we can think about, you know, how, how else can we use it? You know, what else can we do? Uh, how else can we pray and sing and learn the word of God, ask for God's forgiveness, pray for his help, and receive comfort from the word of God. Each psalm uniquely does those things. So we had an intro today. We, our psalms are built into our hymns. They're constantly in the liturgy. Uh, you don't realize just how often and how many and how much of the psalms you are praying and singing. And another goal in Bible study is we want even more singing of the psalms. We want to understand and appreciate the words of the Psalter even more than we already do. Because we can always learn more, right? It's not like, uh, you know, I, should, I tell the young people as they enter a catechesis for three years on Wednesdays, if you learn by heart the entire Athanasian creed, I'll confirm you tomorrow. <laughs> I tell them that. I really do. And then they get all excited. And then one or two of them will start to try learning it. And I'm, I'm not just trying to set them up for failure, but I am saying, like, you, you put in the work and do that and show me that. And I mean it. I will do that because I, no adult, no, I don't know, a pastor or any 
mature Christian or anyone that knows that by heart. Now, we know the apostles and the Nicene by heart, right? Those are regular part of our daily and weekly liturgical life. But uh, that two pager, so I mean, could someone learn all 150 Psalms ever? Do you know that there are some people who have done that? Yeah, I'm serious. All 150. Then you could learn the, yeah, see, it is possible. Yeah, it is possible. So I, I, I want to challenge you not to do the impossible or to despair that you don't know things as well as you might like or as others do, but just to as much as God gives you grace to study and learn and grow and increase in your knowledge and faith of the word of God. You already know one entire psalm by heart. And I know that because I quizzed you a few weeks ago and nobody read his Bible where we all said together in perfect harmony and unison, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And we did the whole, all six verses without looking. So it, you know it's possible because you've already done it. <laughs> and the question is how much is possible with God, all things with us, just a few things are possible. And uh, regarding our salvation, it is all up to God and not to us. So. Let's look now at, uh, at Psalm 32 with that overview here too. Um, another thing we're gonna do in the future is more of a visual overview. We'll be using our uh, new screen here coming up soon. And then also the audio, I would like to introduce some of the instruments that were probably used in the singing of the Psalms in the Old Testament. So a number of instruments are mentioned and some of them are familiar to us today and some are unfamiliar. A lot of them are stringed instruments. Some are percussion instruments. So I will take a study one time and, and just do this overview of the Psalms. What was it like to hear the Psalms and to sing with them uh, in Hebrew, first of all, in that language, and second of all, in the music of 3,000 years ago. So that'll be quite a journey, I think, and maybe open up and enrich our understanding of the Psalms. Now, we, we sing them in our own way, right? We have these tones, we have them marked for singing so that the end of each line is brought to a conclusion and so on, and, and the Gloria Patri at the end, right? But uh, I think that'll be good to look at. So Psalm 32, it is, uh, if you have a study Bible, it'll tell you that there are six Psalms that are in a class of their own. We've already studied one of them, it was Psalm number six. They are called the penitential Psalms. Have you heard that that word, that term, or that phrase, the penitential psalms? What does it mean to be penitential? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. It's a word very closely related to the idea of repentance, which is faith and trust, turning away from sin and confessing it, being forgiven. That's like, you know, I, I said a whole sentence, and it's all in that one word, right? That, that word has a lot to it, penitence and repentance. In Psalm 6, David confesses his sin, and acknowledges God's forgiveness by the end of the psalm. The same thing happens in Psalm 32. This is, as far as the 150 go, probably in the top 10 or 20 well-known psalms, and you'll find out why as we read through it. It's one to be prayed, one to be sung, one to be confessed, and to also give thanks with it as well. Psalm 32, I would like to ask one of you to read the entire psalm out loud, please. Psalm 32. Thank you. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom God has no iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silence, silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bits and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but, the, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. 
Thank you for your reading. And uh, I will uh, I'll actually direct a few things directly to you, Jeremiah, and thank you for your understanding uh, as we go through <laughs> them. Uh, I never want to critique someone for reading. You did a perfect job reading, uh, except you missed three words. Do you know what they are? They're all the same. This word occurs oh, three times. Yeah. I was trying to figure out what you do with that. What do you do with that? So I, again, I'm not critiquing your reading. I would have skipped them too, but I bring that up because what are those words doing there? And why are they, why is it three times? Why are in English translation, they're uh, in italics, right? They're kind of on the right side of the margin instead of on the left or centered with the text. It's obviously set apart. It's obviously not part of the actual prayer, but it's it's what? What, what would it be? Say that. Sure, or? What's that? A refrain? Okay, so like it's obviously repeated. If it's three times, it's something that, that happens. It, it kind of, it breaks up the psalm into three parts in a sense. And I think that, I mean, depending on your typesetting or whatever, there's even a space between verse four and five, between five and six, and between seven and eight. Okay, so here's the thing. Like many other terms in the psalms, whether in the title or in the body of the psalm, here it comes. We're not sure. <laughs> we just, we are not absolutely certain what this word means. It comes up over and over. Uh, we may have seen it before. And if not, uh, here it is, Selah. Uh, some folks think that it's uh, just a pause. So again, back to you, uh, <laughs> dear organist, that uh, when, you have, uh, when you have a rest, right, you play the rest, right? You actually count out the rest. It's not just you take a break and go get coffee and come back. Like you, <laughs> you actually, you stop playing for a specific amount of time, and that's still part of the meter and rhythm of the music, right? So it may be that, say, the fact that it happens here three times and in these particular places is a musical direction. So it's, it's a good assumption. We might be right. Um, same with a maskil, right? You didn't read that. A maskil of David. It, it just means a, a song, probably so a particular. Now, a mizmor is a different kind of song. There's different categories, but we just, uh, even with all the, the Jewish scholarship, the knowledge of Hebrew, the history of the Bible, uh, we're not certain about the exact meaning of these particular words. So that's probably the best guess. Somehow it gives rhythm and breaks up the psalm into different sections. And uh, I don't know if your study Bible has a note about those or not, but somewhere it does say, uh, in, in your introduction, it'll, it'll give you some terms in the Psalms, it'll give you some names in the Psalms. It says, Selah. Oh, look, it's in, in, the, in here. Um, it says, a Hebrew musical notation, which doesn't answer anything. <laughs> of course it is, right? The, the Psalms are musical and it's a notation, but what does it mean? Like, what is the point? So maybe it is a rest or a pause. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you find or hear or think anything else on that, let me know, because there might be some other ideas, but I read a long psalms and read all the sailors in it. And after I was done, they told me I didn't need to read those. <laughs> <laughs> I think they got tired of hearing they that. <laughs> Sela, yeah. But if Sela was a break or a pause, then you were thankful for Sela, right? Because you got to take a, take a breather every few verses. Yeah. Um, a couple things I was looking up here quick. One is to the effect that it means forever. Mm. The other example was it looks like it's used similar, it specifically says similar to that of Amen, so be it, and I'm just reading how for the right here, in that it stresses the truth and importance of the preceding passage. Mm. You have amens throughout the service, right? That's kind of for emphasis. It's for agreement. It's a liturgical response, right? It's always nice in a conversation uh, to have not just a monologue, but also a response, right? Some back and forth, right? Liturgy is a conversation. Hearing God's word and praying back to him, that's an ongoing conversation. And so we, uh, we do want to respond. And that, that would also be a nice thing to think. Obviously, some of the Psalms are very... Uh, very much an antiphon or an, uh, yeah, antiphonal, right? So that it's definitely made where the, the leader sings the first line, the congregation responds. First line responds all throughout. So maybe Selah is part of that. What else does Wikipedia have to say? <laughs> so it's also a pause for reflection. Mm -hmm. So just kind of looking at verse five specifically, um, the second half of verse five is part of divine service three. There it is. 
Peace Confession. Yes. We do a pause right there in Divine Service 3. Is that where? Interesting. <laughs> that was my next point. Is. How did you know where I was going with <laughs> that? That's it. The, the most awkward part when you wonder has something gone wrong or is someone asleep or something is at the beginning of the service when there's a, a bunch of silence. Now, in one sense, I don't know if this is true for you, but many of us are, are really just have constant noise, right? There's always something going on, whether it's the hum of the machinery or the vehicle or the music or the TV, right? That uh, I think more people than before, even headphones, even in your head, yeah, um, it, it's constant, right? There's no actual pure total quiet. So that if there is ever, it's really uncomfortable. And no one's trying to make anyone uncomfortable here at church, or at least they shouldn't be. But that time of silence, there's, a, there's that red rubric or that line, right? What are, we, what are we doing in those 10 seconds? Don't time it. Don't worry about that. I, I try not to. But the, the point is, like, what, what is the point? Why is there a moment of silence? A few moments. Yeah, reflection. For It says self-examination. What is that? How, I mean, do I do that? Do you do that? What's self-examination? You know what it's like to examine other people. We do that all the time, but here's a time to <clears throat> examine myself. And and respond, right? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, there is a voice in your head, in each of our head, and it, we've talked about the conscience quite a bit, right? This is tied into that. What's what's the use? What are we going to do if you haven't already? during that next few moments of silence, uh, right before we confess our sins together. Sure, measure yourself. Uh, so on the way into church, someone said, you know, I, I saw this really interesting saying and I, I really kept it in mind just so I could repeat it to you on the way in. And here's what it was. It, he said, the 10 commandments are not multiple choice. <laughs> and I said, yeah, amen, that's true. And the, the Psalms repeat over and over again the statutes, the laws, the commands, and the decrees of God, and even say things like, I delight in them, and I love them, and I meditate on them, and I think about them. Not once a week, but day and night. Can you imagine thinking about the commandments more than <laughs> for a few seconds a week? It's, um, but that's, that time is set apart for that. So in that tiny bit of time we have, here's the thing. This confession, it, uh, Psalm 32, this penitential psalm is in the first person, right? Um, it starts off, blessed is the one or the man. That's a general thing. We'll talk about it. But verses three, all the way to five are, are singular. I, right? I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. Who's the I? It's David, right? It's the writer. And, and, it's, and it's whoever prays or confesses with a psalm thereafter, right? Now, to you, I acknowledge my sin to you. Who's the you? God. It's to God, yeah. Now we get to Psalm 51, we will rejoice in the importance and the value of individual absolution with the pastor or with the prophet because Nathan the prophet was there and he heard David's confession and he absolved him and forgave his sins. There's value in that. There's also value in confessing directly to God. There's also value in confessing to each other, to husband or wife or friend throughout the week, whenever. Yeah. And, uh, and then there's also value, like we did this morning and every Sunday, confessing all together. Uh, so we, right, we have sinned and fallen short. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean, not just accidentally or occasionally, but by nature. It's, it's much deeper and more severe than just sometimes or accidentally. So we're confessing all of it. So David in the Psalms will occasionally confess particular sins. And those may or may not be at any given time your sins and my sins. That's why Sunday morning confession during church is general, right? We call it corporate confession or general confession. We don't name any particular sins. We aren't going through and saying, I stole, or I gossiped, or I lusted, or I coveted this or that, or I cursed, or I disrespected parents or other authorities, right? Because everyone has done it at some point, but whether that's my particular sin that's troubling me or it's something that I've done this week, 
right? That's why we keep it general. And we just plead guilty of all sins. That I'm sinful by nature and I've sinned against you. What? In thought, word, and deed, everything, right? And it's for everybody. I don't forget, I'm trying to remember where it is that either it's one of the apostles or Jesus that says you break one, you broke them all. Very true. Yeah, so. you've heard that. It says that in the book of James. Yeah. If you're guilty of one point, you're guilty of it all. Now, that doesn't seem fair, right? but uh, with, with God, it's, it's all or nothing, right? Breaking one commandment breaks the first, and thereby all of them having another God, following some other rule besides the one God gave you. Uh, it's also all or nothing with the good news, which is good for us. Because he gives it all to us by grace and he overlooks our sins, pardons, forgives, drowns and buries. He even takes away the, the guilt and the effects of our sins in certain ways in this life. And especially in the fact that it's not counted against us and that our sins won't be stuck with us in eternal life. That's the best part. So we struggle with them for 70, 80, 90 years and then we're done with them forever. That's what it means. That's the good news. So there's a, the structure of the psalm is that the first two verses are general, and they sound a lot like psalm number one, don't they? Because the whole psalter, the whole book of psalms begins with the word blessed. blessed. Yeah, yeah. blessed is the one, blessed is the man. Doesn't it remind you of that? It takes you back to the beginning. Blessed is the man, psalm one, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. That's, that's the law, right? Don't do that. Then the gospel, the same man, but his delight, the blessed man, is in the law of the Lord, and on his law or word he meditates day and night. So David gets more specific with here in Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose what? Yeah, is forgiven, and whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no see did you notice four different words here for for sin for missing the mark for breaking the rules there's transgression there's sin there's iniquity and there's deceit, deceit. yeah so the parallel that it says it one way then another it says it another way and then a, and a, right so this double line parallelism of the poetry of the songs there's different aspects of sin there of course there's original sin the that's that's the disease their actual sins, those are the symptoms, right? To use the medical analogy. The, um, then there's the, the soul or the mind, he mentions uh, in whose spirit there's no deceit. So there, there would be more of like a guilt or anxiety about sin, right? So you have the, what causes it, what, the, you know, what actually happens, how you feel about it and what it does to others, right? You could just kind of look at sin in a number of different ways. The most important one is what God thinks about it. Right? How does God feel? We don't stop to ask this. What does it mean when we sin and break the commandments? Does it matter? Is it a little oopsie or is it rightly earning God's temporal and eternal punishment? That's right now and forever. We just think, how could you know God let anyone suffer or die or and things like that? And then we think, well, the truth is that we all deserve this all the time. And it shows the grace of God that much more when we recognize the weight and seriousness of each of our sins and all of them put together. I've heard it said, and it's very true, uh, little sin, little savior. Big sin, bigger savior. Amen? Did I get that right? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Have you heard that? <laughs> Isn't that true? I mean, if our, if our sins are just a little, if they're not a big deal, and if the commandments are suggestions or multiple choice, or if uh, everyone sins, therefore it must not be that big a problem. Well, what, what need is there of this grand, mighty, wonderful, perfect, loving Savior to lay down his life for us? No, uh, sin is a life and death issue, right and wrong. And uh, our Savior doesn't come to save us by, uh, with morality and with making us feel bad and with forcing us to do good. He, he comes to take away our sin for free and to love us while we were yet sinners. Go ahead. But um, there's no such thing as little sin and big sin. Mm. I mean, in God's definition of a sin. In, in the eyes of God, yeah, I'll say that. Well, well, now, in well, you, yeah. How do you, 
how do you look at that phrase and you know a big tin a little tin little figure yeah, th this is our perspective, right? The, the, our perspective. If, if my perspective on sin is that it's small and not a big deal, then I would have no need for a big, mighty, wonderful, loving Savior, right? Now, the fact, the fact is, but regardless of my perception, the fact is that sin is big and the Savior is bigger. That's the truth. The perception, which is a false one, that sin is little, requires only a little Savior. It's right? what the world it's what, yeah, and it's what we all think by nature, right? We want to minimize it. Oh, well, someone else is worse. Oh, well, I didn't mean to. Oh, well, I only, did, you know, one time. You know, that can, we always want to, but instead, confess it, right? David doesn't hold back. Like, I was up all night crying, right? I was, uh, my sin, you know, separated me from God. It destroyed my relationship with my family, with the kingdom, with, uh, even with my enemies. They saw that and mocked me, you know, this kind of, like, he, he, doesn't minimize it. He just lays it all out there. And that's, that, that's hard. <laughs> Nobody wants to be that open with God or with himself or with others. I, I think any of those, I mean, we kind of want to just kind of <laughs> not think about it or move past it or forget it. Better to confess it and be forgiven. That's, uh, it's, it's hard at first, but it's very healthy. It's the, it's the daily life of the Christian. Please. I was going to say, certain televangelists, how you see that statement is true in their preaching? When, how severe a problem do they define sin also connects to how they preach or teach Jesus and his death. And it's, you can see it in where, how they spend their focus on their preaching and teaching. You bet. Let me use some words that I hear a lot in that regard and then kind of how we, how we might think or respond to it. Often instead of sin or trespass, death or hell or whatever we've earned, there's a brokenness or disconnection. Now the solution of those things is uh, getting fixed, right? If it's broken, it needs fixed. And if it's disconnected, it needs to be reconnected. Now I think we can and should look at sin that way, but recognize that it's not just that. It's more than being broken. Yeah, it's broken, but it's also dead, right? It's completely beyond hope apart from Christ, right? Uh, Christ didn't come just to fix us, but to bring us from death into life. So it, it's a life and death issue, right? And not just a broken fixing issue. See what I mean? It's, it's more important and more serious and more joyful than if you, if you just look at the, the fixing part of it. Well, I think along with what he said, I think that sometimes it's very clearly taught to people that this is not as bad as that one. You know, the sin. And mm -hmm. I think in many religions, it's not not about a sin is a sin, and you're damned even for the the little one in our worldly view. Um, you know, I'm not so bad, you know, and everybody else does that. It's different than I robbed a bank and killed two people, and I think. I think some, I wouldn't both say congregations, but I think sometimes people are taught that they're kind of bad. You bet. That yeah. Bothers me. <laughs> yeah, and it should, and it should. I mean, why, do you, why does Jesus over and over again say that, you know, tax collectors and prostitutes make it into heaven and that upright, you know, uh, t pay their taxes, friendly, well-off, you know, well-respected Pharisees are not getting in? That's offensive. That overturns everything we thought we knew about uh, about morality, right and wrong, sin and forgiveness. But but it ultimately doesn't because it shows that the attitude of the heart, and not just the outward appearance, goods, success, and reputation are the main thing. Right. The main thing is the love of Christ and the free forgiveness for everybody, including the people who we think shouldn't get it, right, or even ourselves, and and so on. It's for everybody. And so this, uh, this forgiveness, I, had a, I have a, a good friend who uh, used to go to church and no longer does. And he said, well, do I, do I have to go? Do I need to go? And I said that it doesn't seem or feel like you need to go. It seems and feels as though we can go without it. I, I'm not sure how, I mean, what, what would we say in that regard? Like I can worship at home. Sure. Does anyone, I mean, uh, I can read the Bible. Good. Right. 
But are, is there something that happens in the gathering of God's people that doesn't happen elsewhere? And we're talking about communion and we're talking about hearing the word, praying with each other, being encouraged and supported by each other. So I said that uh, I need it and you need it and everyone needs it far more than we realize because we're not just fixed or improved at church. We are brought from death into life and our faith is strengthened for eternity. How? Hearing the word, <laughs> forgiveness of sins, Christ's body and blood, and then all the other benefits of like seeing each other and talking to each other and praying with each other and singing with each other, you know, or if, or if you're not up to it, listening to the others sing, right? These, these are good, positive things that God brings you, and they wouldn't happen otherwise. And that's why he wants you to be here. And when you can't, we'll come and bring church to you. Just to emphasize, it's externally being proclaimed. The work of God's word and law are being externally proclaimed. And it's not just a merely an internal reflection if you're trying to do, follow the me yourself in my Bible. Because you have, if that's what you're following, your mind's your own perception. So thank you for mentioning those things and, uh, and asking and answering them. You see what happens um, in verses three, four, and five when we don't go this route. For when I kept silence, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Now, you may or may have not had this experience. Sometimes it's about someone else's sin and how it's affecting you. Sometimes it's about your own sin and how it makes you feel guilty. Sometimes it's about just the general effects of sin in the world, which is to say that we're all sinners and there is sin and it leads to death and that's why people suffer and die. So for any of those reasons, we can identify with David and pray this to God that if we keep silent and try to hold it in or just be brave and soldier on, that can work for a time. But what's much better is just putting it all out there, telling the truth, giving all of our inmost thoughts, concerns, and desires to the Lord in our prayers, both individually and together as the church. And uh, it feels in verse four, like day and night, your hand is heavy upon me, right? That, that it's a, a chastisement or correction from the Lord. And sometimes it is. And then we can identify with the other part of verse four, this week in particular, being dried up by the heat of summer. <laughs> How did that happen so soon? We had, we had the heat out a week ago, and now we can't go anywhere without air conditioning. <laughs> but God is still with us. And even when your strength is dried up and you get dehydrated and tired, he loves to hear your prayer and your confession, and he's always ready and willing and glad to forgive. So in verse 5, you said this today, we'll say it every week in the divine service. Directly from Psalm 32, verse 5. Here's a perfect use for the Psalms in every weekly worship. I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Look at it again. The problem, it, it, you, you had the blessing in the first two verses, the problem in three and four, the confession in verse five, and then the forgiveness. It, it's like the whole Christian life, the whole divine service 
And even those four different ways of saying it, sin, iniquity, transgressions, right? Those are all forgiven. Those are all taken away. I believe this is the Psalm of the Day for Ash Wednesday. It's a good one for Lent. It's a good one if you're preparing for individual confession and absolution. It's a good one to pray before church begins when you get hurt early, which you all do. And then there's Selah, right? Which you, I guess you don't read. You just kind of take a breath and a pause. And, and then, you, then there's this almost this exhortation to, in verse 6, this invitation. Look, come and find help. I know where to find it. It's not a place to go when you think you're perfect, right? Or, or I mean, it is. It's for everybody. But it's, it's a place you go to, to uh, confess your sin and be forgiven. It's a place for sinners. All sinners are welcome. So everyone who's godly, offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. And then this joyful part here, you're a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Uh, then he switches, and it's kind of interesting to me, uh, from addressing God. So the first two verses are general. They're blessings or beatitudes, right? Just like Psalm 1, just like Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount with the same word that the Psalms begin, right? Then it gets personal and confessing in the middle. But then here at the end, I, I think it, it's like David turns and instructs you, right? My son Solomon, or my people Israel, or whoever's listening, right? Now it's time for some teaching and encouragement with regard to what we just did. I'll instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I'll counsel you with my eye upon you. Um, so it, it won't work out real well today, but... Well, once we have this visual overview here and I get through enough Psalms that it's good to do that, I've got this picture. Maybe you can see it. Maybe you can't really see it at all. I, I think it's hilarious and it's perfect for today. Don't be like this. <laughs> Don't be like this guy. Now, the guy is doing what? Yeah. And what's the donkey doing? He's pulling back. He's digging in. Right? <laughs> the guy's just pulling as hard as he can. Don't be like that. The, uh, the horse and the mule, you've personally dealt with this when you try to pull your mule into town <laughs> or your horse. That too, training your dog, right? Trying to keep, or yeah, trying to, trying to keep him near you, right? Like stop running away, come, come on, come back, let's go. You know? um, don't be like that, right? They have to be controlled by a bit or a bridle or they won't come near you, right? Don't, don't resist and, and do this out of compulsion, right? Or, or refuse to do it at all, right? Do it joyfully, lovingly, right? You can lead the mule to water, but anyway, that's, <laughs> the, the point is like, it, it won't come near you. Um, we're all like this sometimes and we're stubborn. But it's, it's one thing to say, I should confess my sins and be forgiven. It's another thing when someone else tells me I've sinned, right? Because then I, I dig in. And I, and I get defensive like this with the walls going up. And I, that, that's, a, that's a psychological human reaction to an accusation is uh, defending yourself, right? My first thought isn't to say, oh, I'm really sorry. My first thought is, wait, wait, who are you? To, or, you know, I didn't even, uh, or you know, you've done worse than that. And that kind of, you know, any number of deflections or excuses or trying to minimize it or ignore it. But instead, if we have indeed sinned, let us be gracious, willing, and ready to confess to God and to each other. And not just to argue and defend, but to forgive and be forgiven. Amen. So don't, don't be like that without understanding. Um, and then and another warning in verse 10, many are the sorrows of the wicked, right? Even if they should succeed in this life and seem to be happy and better off, uh, the sorrows are still there and they may last forever without repentance. So don't, again, don't be like that, but, and here's more blessings and it ends with the gospel as almost all the Psalms do. Steadfast love, that's a, that's a God word, right? It's, it's only used of him. Steadfast love, it's always there for you from him surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. So be glad is the result of all this. Rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. So 
So how is it that we've just talked about this nearly every week? How is it that we can be called righteous? You just got done confessing your sin. So how can you also at the same time be righteous? Through Christ. Amen. Through faith in Christ. Yeah, the, everyone's a sinner. And those who believe are forgiven sinners, right? That a righteous person is a forgiven sinner. So what else on Psalm 32? Your thoughts or comment or question about the uh, the horse and the mule psalm or the, uh, <laughs> the uh, confession and absolution psalm, the one that we hear every Sunday before we join our voices, confess, hear the absolution, and then joyful. What do we do right after that? Let's sing, right? We just got forgiven. Why don't we sing the intro it, and then we'll get on with the service. It's great. And what, what else are you going to do after you're forgiven? Why don't, why don't we sing and rejoice together? Could we say the sailors could be the proverbial mic drop? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, is there one at the end, or is it? Uh, no, there's, there is a, yeah, there's, they're kind of in the middle. That's where it is at. Mm. It's emphasizing those specific points. It's like when it stops and has a sailor, that's all I, the, all I have to say on the subject. Yeah. Proverbially. That's it. <laughs> The game over, right? <laughs> yeah. So it, it happens in verse four, right? This is the result of my sin. I confess and you forgave me, Selah, right? That's it. And then uh, you, you surround me with shouts of deliverance, right? It, it does break that up. Then his instruction to the others around him continues. So it is, uh, it's, yeah. I like the mic drop idea. <laughs> I won't do it now, but. What's he trying to say there in verse six? He says, therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Then this is the part that I don't really understand. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach them. Well, you probably noticed that I skipped over that quickly because I also did not understand it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad that we're coming well, back to it right now. <laughs> I was in a hurry because I didn't want to <laughs> see. I'm confessing, and uh, but but let's talk about it and think of it. It's I mean the first thing in reading here, let alone if we're going to pray and confess this ourselves. What, what's the subject, right? What's the object? Like who's doing what? What's happening to whom? Uh, I'm sure that it's connected to verse 7. So, having confessed and been forgiven, let everyone offer prayer to you, that's God, at a time when you, God, may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they, I'm sure would refer to the waters, will not, uh, shall not reach him. So, what kind of rushing uh, great waters would, would those be? Chaos of the world. Yeah, I mean. Chaos of our sin. Absolutely, right? You've, you've had to deal with, uh, with flooding, right? Or with uh, danger at sea or something like that, that water gives life, and yet it also drowns and destroys, takes. takes life too. So the rush of great waters here would be a threat, it would be a problem. They shall not reach him is God defending you from these drowning flood waters. Now it literally happened in the what? In the flood. And it literally happens when God preserves and defends people during less global floods and other disasters. But here I would say we also have in view, you know, if you're a hiding place for me and you preserve me from trouble and surround me with shouts of deliverance, that's God defending and protecting you from the results of our sins that we rightly deserve, right? And calling those rushing great waters. Does that sound good? Have we done that justice? <laughs> Could be illness, yeah, sickness too. Like a great something great that's happening too. Yeah, and it overwhelms you, right? All of a sudden, it takes up all your time, all your money, all your thoughts, patience, you know, love and trust. Yeah. This time God is telling God to use extreme measures to disturb the routine of one's life in order to show His anger and mercy. Mm. That's a that's a very what do you think about that? That's, I mean, it's true. It makes sense with the first verse, because the first, the first part of verse 7 is talking about turning to God in time of need, mm. in prayer and supplication. Yeah, I mean, look at the groaning and the bones wasting away and the heaviness and the strength dried up in 3 and 4. And the, the rush of great waters. Now, God, uh, God can give you a wake-up call, and pain is sometimes his way to do that. He, he can and does refocus our, our faith and life and our heart and our trust uh, 
what, where did we just read this? Uh, I said in my, there it is, Psalm 30. I said in verse 6, Psalm 30, verse 6. And I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. Right? I'm doing fine. Who needs prayer and worship and forgiveness? Uh, you know, the, the bank account looks good. The weather's great. You know, I, you know, I have what I want. I feel great. Uh, it is those times where we forget to pray, forget to confess, and realize our need for Christ's help. So when he sends you the cross and the affliction and the difficulty and the rushing waters, it is uh, ultimately for your good. It is always to draw you closer, and it is to help us recognize our need, pray, praise, ask for help, and then give thanks and rejoice, even if we don't immediately receive the exact help that we perhaps need or want in the moment. That's why he gives you arthritis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, there's not always a connection between arthritis and I, you know, lied on my taxes, right? There's not always like this direct correspondence between a particular sin and a particular affliction. Sometimes it is, right? I do this or that behavior and I get this or that, you know, disease or, or what have you. Um, but, but not always. In fact, not not most of the time. Most of the time, we get old, we get sick, we're human, we're mortal, and this cross or rushing water should help us to turn back to God and to repent and love and trust in him and realize that he delivers us in this life from all kinds of evil and in the life of the world to come from every evil forever. There's a lot there in Psalm 32. I hope that it can and should be a regular, right? If you, if you think, what's one place I should go to here or Psalm 51? Now, there's six of these penitential psalms. This one in Psalm 51, I think, especially. Now, you prayed Psalm 32 this morning right before confessing and being forgiven. Then you prayed Psalm 51, and you sang it, right? Because you always sing it right after the sermon and right before the prayers. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Psalm of David, number 51. I can't wait till we get there. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good one. And so the, the, these are already a part of your of your worship and prayer life. I was just thinking, going back to um, someone saying they, can, they pray at home and you know, they need to go to church. You know what we brought up. I think after being through the pandemic last year, and watching it on TV and not being there in person, we all realize how much different that is. And it, it certainly is a need to be in church and not watching it online. It truly is. Now, you know, it's, it's just not the same. It is. Yeah, there, there are certain things we, we can't get or don't get in the same way. I mean, you can yeah. watch communion, but you're not participating. You're not receiving it. Yeah. Um, so maybe you don't sing because you're by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> but no one will hear it either. So, yeah. <laughs> except God. And he yeah. Uh, so the, the main thing, uh, yeah, we're going to continue to uh, record and stream for now. And the, the idea is for folks who can't come, we actually have some shut in members in the wheelchair who have a device and can hear and sing and pray and with us. And that's good that's a good right? use of that, also, right? It, uh, it also kind of encourages people that are not come back. Mm not come back to well i can watch it on you know my, i guess i'll just stay in my pajamas today. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah but really it does and it's i mean it's there for all of us to do that and so it's you know it's not necessarily that part of it isn't good but i'll tell you what every one of you that i talked to over the past year uh individuals families i called and asked how are you doing and are you getting the you know the either the printed service or the recorded service and Every single one that I talked to said, I can't wait to get back to church. Now, now some of you said, yeah, it's nice being on the couch and you know, that kind of thing. You, have to, you can watch it anytime, that kind of well, thing. It's nice but, to have the option to have that yeah, you know, when we couldn't sure. be here. Couldn't be here. Sure. That, that's the difference, right? That was, that was the difference. But now it's, there's no reason. Yeah, it's, that's it's, right. There's no reason not to come right. if you can. Exactly. It's so much different. And nobody so, said to me, um, I would like to keep on doing this and not ever have to yeah. come back in person. Nobody said that. Now, maybe some think that, but nobody told me that, and I believe them, and thank God for that, this desire to, you know, Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place, right, the meeting of the saints where your glory dwells. I love that. And all 
so can't um, wait for the next one. <laughs> we could say, you know, that God is with the faithful in their homes. Yeah, so always. It really is different. Mm. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, it's both and, right? There should never be this, oh, well, why come to this one? I could do that. Well, why don't, why don't we do both? Like, <laughs> that's what God wants. That, that's what he's commanded and given. Yeah. So maybe to put another spin on the online versus in person, this is probably more visible from your spot as the officiating shepherd, not necessarily as obvious from the audience, but there is an uncertainty about who is listening online, who's watching online, and how they're participating. And if you're participating watching online, there's the element in your head, depending on how you think about it, is that absolution that the pastor is speaking to this congregation and these people that are present here, is that being applied to you? Well, I mean, there's an element of some people talk about if we're doing online, should we do it like the general acknowledgement option? There is a certainty that being in the same place as the pastor who declaring the absolution, I mean, there's a certainty to that. And it just be, taking that online element, that streaming element out of the picture removes some of that uncertainty. You bet. Yeah. So I, I guess I'll try to briefly, I certainly agree with that. Um, the word of God goes out in many ways. We're very, very thankful, especially this past year, that it could go out in a, a pretty, uh, pretty quickly figured this out, uh, easy, quick, direct uh, way to as many people as possible. Uh, in the last hundred years, the word of God has been preached and taught over the radio and on the TV and over the internet, and still continued with printed things, right? And, uh, but, but most of all in person. Now the best thing, if these things are all working together, the use of technology to disseminate the word of God and offer the forgiveness of Christ and offer teaching leading the community together is that they direct folks to a church family in person with a pastor, with people, because Jesus wants us to know each other. He wants us to see each other. Uh, it's unfortunate if we're in jail or if we're shut in or sick or can't make it, right? It's not the norm, right? That's the exception. Like it, it, whenever possible, we want to, and we need to be here to see each other, to know each other, know who we're communing with, know who we're absolving, know who is being taught and who desires to be taught. And uh, it's, it's a family. It's not, it's not anything other than that. It's the brothers and sisters of Christ and therefore also of each other. So uh, that's, that's God's will for us. Anything else before we close and before we uh, head home and uh, plan to meet together again, unless Jesus comes again first, because then we'll meet in heaven. <laughs> okay. Receive the blessing of our Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Thank you.